I will try to have a little experiment, maybe also with you in the next uh, 30 minutes, since um, maybe it's not such a, let's say, clear, uh, elaborated um, presentation on what might ethnographic map mapping, map making, uh, and the set TB in the context of uh, time space matters. But maybe it's more on the urgency why I think this topic is so important and why I use mapping since quite some time to explore um, urban space and it's, yeah, it's making. Um, so maybe another history of urbanization is needed and therefore I think mapping is super central. And uh, in the end, um, one or two maps might illustrate, yeah, how this other history it's also um, loading our need of other tools. Um, I started a couple of years ago asking myself what the traditional commons on the left hand uh, picture might have to do with the notion of urban commons nowadays and what kind of continuities we can find in these two um, modes of spatial production. The left one I thought very clearly spatially indicated and the right one rather situated within questions of um, action, practice and governance. And um, um, the deeper I went into the question of, of commoning and common space, the clearer it became that um, the production of common spaces is something continuing since ever probably, and that it might help for us to understand the traditional, um, yeah, types, spatial arrangements of common lands as something which is still embedded in our contemporary notion of um, urban commons and that maybe something like the urbanization of the commons is rather helping us to understand what contemporary common space might mean, especially for us as architects and planners, uh, of whom not so many are uh, engaged into the research, it's more like a political economical, social science um, topic. But if we look uh, through the history of, of architectural and urban um, development, we, we see the notion of commons without calling it like that, maybe. Um, it, it leads like a red thread through um, yeah, changes of more emancipatory projects um, in architecture and urban design, and then periods again where this is being, yeah, in a certain way uh, pushed aside again. So um, in my research, I tried to understand how we could better define this kind of very peculiar production of space. And of course, we uh, come to this very first approach of a linear uh, process of a spatial resource being appropriated by commoners through acts of commoning, establishing their own common rules. And then the common land, the, the, um, the alp space or the village green or the pasture, um, yeah, is the actual spatial yield which they um, cult cultivated and produced commonly. But then there is a very interesting um, quote of Leven de Kout, the Belgian philosopher, who helps us to distinguish the universal commons as generic commons without community, nature and culture as such, and the particular commons as practices of commoning by a specific community. This I found a very enriching uh, statement since it helps us to understand the production of common space as something um, circular, reproductive, especially by introducing the readings of Silvia Federici, who uh, lightens or yeah, highlights uh, the aspect of reproductive action within um, the common space production. Um, so actually the common land is part of a process which constantly also reproduces the universal common good as a spatial resource. So the city as a universal common good is being reproduced in each kind of little spatial commons, um, mm, yeah, created by a certain community. And then if David Harvey 
joins in with his um, common good definition of any kind of social relation within the common, then any part of this circular production of space might it be the universal spatial commons as the resources which uh, belong to all of us and in a sense also to none of us, uh, and the particular spatial commons in a certain uh, yeah, niche uh, open space in the city or also housing as a commons. And all the rules we organize around all the common uh, intangible goods being produced there collectively are all to be defined as yields, benefits, results of this process. Keeping this in mind, uh, we can take um, over um, the diagram of Elino Ostrom, very famous economic and political scientist. And she, um, helps us to understand that in um, economics, there is not only three types of goods, so that the common good is not a third type of good, but there is even four different types of goods. So beyond the public and the private, we have as well common goods, but also club goods, which is extremely helpful since it distinguishes closed collective space from open collective space. We could go into, these dia diagrams a bit deeper, but I think for this session now it's important to take with us that common space has in common with private space that it's self-governed, self-defined, self-regulated, and it has in common with public space that it's open, accessible to all, that it's inclusive and e exclusion is infeasible, how Elino Ostrom would say. And club space is rather the opposite. Um, it is defined through feasible exclusion, so it's a rather closed space that what it has to, in common with private space, but it is as um, yeah, other organized or other governed as public space. So it's not the users themselves who define the rules in the club space, but it's some authority which establishes the major rules. And I think those two um, definitions um, of a space being self-defined and self-organized and inclusive as yeah, the basics for a common space is helping us to uh, also understand that um, a club space, a particular spatial club would open up when the spatial resource is not being reproduced anymore, but an accumulation and extraction of the yields are taking place. And I think those um, yeah, four sets of um, space production, which never appear in an exclusive way, I mean, exclusive in the sense of there is no space being truly private, truly public, truly club or common, but they all intermingle, um, infiltrate each other. And the question is, which one is the dominant production? And this leads um, to this other history I was talking about in which uh, our ideas of ownership are constantly changing. The institution of ownership is nothing stable. It is being renegotiated from time to time over and over again. And if you come from antique to middle ages, to modern times, to postmodernism, to now, there is a constant uh, change of these different ideas of ownership and how they interfere with each other. This is a, a site in, in today's Turkey, cut, I'm, I'm sure I will misspell <laughs> it, Çatay uh, Hökük. It's a nested system, how Elino Ostrom would uh, call it. You see it in the reconstruction drawing on the upper right. It's a city which is very old, almost 10,000 years ago, the spatial structure was established. And in this kind of nested way, one could estimate also looking at uh, the findings there of um, female as well as male statues, um, which assume that it was a matriarchal culture. But I refer mostly to this spatial system, which we can see in, in the earth being digged out and in the drawing, that it's a nested system of non-hierarchic uh, interwoven spaces, which um, yeah, lead maybe to the speculation that um, before there was a separation between the dichotomic idea of public and private, uh, common space was 
quite um, yeah, a common thing how space would have been produced. This is a 3D modeling, super clean, the opposite of any kind of uh, ethnographic research, I think, but maybe not, um, of, of Pergamon, um, a city which um, only starts to be understandable if one sees this much, much um, later being produced uh, uh, illustrations of different um, life uh, livelihoods, but also spatial productions. Uh, so we have the private house of apparently very wealthy family and the Agora, uh, which is the center of the polis, which is yeah the incorporated idea of, of our understanding of public um, space and public uh, governance and uh, the Agora as a space of negotiation only becomes alive when people start using it and uh, yeah, open it up as a collective space which enables for a few people in the polis, 5,000 of 20 or 30,000, I think, uh, to be a truly collectivized um, uh, open space, which maybe tends to be a common space within the system of, of the polis. Um, another model of, uh, um, of Rome, the Forum Romanum, uh, again, very uh, technical rendering of the physical uh, appearance of that space. And if you overlay it with uh, much uh, later, meaning not, uh, of course, not um, then contemporary illustrations of the activities going on there, the space becomes readable as uh, yeah, in partly uh, private uh, spaces of then already tenants' houses and truly private houses, but also the Forum Romanum is a place where, um, yeah, appearance of political negotiations, decisions, social life, um, or kind of uh, um, uh, rituals happen, and um, this physical representation becomes a space of action and practice and use. Um, when, when, I tr when I started to, to try to find out how the concept of commons could be used as a mode of reading the history of cities in a different way, uh, I got lost in uh, the peculiar um, yeah, localities of architectural, uh, examples and this very banal uh, drawings which you can find on some euroatlas.net in the internet and which you can run as GIFs um, became very helpful by realizing that yeah through this transformation through space um, it's extremely uh, challenging to uh, relocate oneself over and over again and also the very important and uh, established and hegemonial often examples we uh, know from architectural and urban design history. And this sequence of, of maps of, um, yeah, actually the falling apart of the Roman Empire um, helps us a lot, I think, and is still at the same moment super overwhelming to contextualize um, yeah, the, the sequence of examples with which we try to study and learn the historic continuities and discontinuities of, of spatial production in this uh, perspective now is super uh, Europe centered, of course. And um, by, um, yeah, abstracting those, um, yeah, historical schemes in the end, nothing more are these maps. Um, um, a contemporary drawing of that time is uh, extremely intriguing, I find, the Tabula Poitingiriana. It's a map that was drawn in uh, 375 and reconstructed around 1200. And what I found very intriguing about this document, which uh, gives an indication of that period in time and how people read, understood, measured, and also then communicated their um, idea of, of space is um, uh, quite exciting for us, I think, because it combines a geographical idea of space 
together with the architectural artifacts, so um, landmarks in which one could um, uh, orientate uh, herself, but it also um, repeats the uh, yeah the time aspect while traveling through this space. So the whole area around now we are at the north of Italy, this whole uh, region around um, the Mediterranean is uh, lined up as a yeah as a linear uh, narrative. And you read the space through the different locations and also through the idea being uh, yeah on a boat probably and uh, driving along these maps. Uh, after, um, yeah, to take again the color code of, of, of common space and club space, uh, after um, or at the beginning of, of, the, of the Middle Ages, there is a notion of Federici Caliban and the Witches, the book which I used a lot to do research around the commons. She writes about the 200 years between 400 and 600 serfdom developed in Europe between the 5th and 7th centuries in response to the collapse of the system of slavery on which the economy of the Roman Empire had been based. So this continuity of um, chapters in history, which we normally look at in, in yeah, chapters, so disconnected parts, opens up here into a continuous narrative. The peasantry was placed in a subordinate position so that for the three centuries, the terms for peasant were used synonymously with that for serf. So she uh, builds a lot on this continuity and then again in harsh contrast, um, this disability of mapping, uh, even if you turn it into a GIF where one map follows the other, this disability of, of the cartography um, yeah, to, to help us to uh, capture the continuation of, of um, yeah, the transformations in space and the different, um, yeah, receptions we draw from this uh, through time. Common land as a space of um, action, of activity, of practice, of social relations, um, much less, um, yeah, a graspable uh, territory, but more, um, yeah, at that uh, drawing from 1500, most of all a feast in terms of, can, in terms of changing the master servant relationship, the most important aspect of serfdom was that the serfs were given direct access to their means of production in return for their work. They received their own piece of land for self-sufficiency. The use of the commons went hand in hand with the use of the land. These were meadows, forests, lakes, wild pastures from which the peasant economy drew essential resources, firewood, timber, fish, ponds, Raising land for cattle at the same time, the commons promoted the cohesion of the community and cooperation within it. I'm reading this out to um, yeah, com come back to, to this question of continuity, how close the idea of traditional commons, if you really open up to all the different levels of definition, not only on a spatial, but also on a social and economical and political level, that it's being a place a space being um, produced and reproduced day per day by a community uh, and how this could help us to also read uh, contemporary common spaces as um, yeah as, as a product of social interaction much more maybe than a certain uh, spatial configuration in terms of territory borders and so on although uh, this is uh, still part of the spatial system of the commons, of course. Another um, image with which we could try to get a grasp at a certain moment of time of the uh, spatial production in around 1300 is this um, uh, yeah, painting, which is more like a vision, uh, uh, the allegory of a good uh, governance and a view into this landscape, which is um, a continuation of parceled pieces of land, but also unparceled, rather wild, open nature at the border of the city. And uh, the city is a place where the inside of the house is opening up towards public space and where we could read this intermediate spaces of workshops 
uh, little commerce basis markets as uh, something which is negotiating between the private of the house and the public of uh, the yeah, outside space in the city. Uh, while the notion of public and private was only um, step by step or successively being re-implemented in the late uh, Middle Ages into a notion of um, of yeah urban space production uh, in this palazzo on the right hand side this allegory uh, is hanging and what is exciting about the city or the yeah, republic of siena is this uh, square which is surrounded by uh, yeah by public publico palazzo publico public buildings and uh, the towers of the merchants and uh, no church building, which is super peculiar in the Middle Ages, and where we can also um, yeah, read out that um, the very exciting learning for us, I think, in the spatial, spatial production of the Middle Ages is that we had um, episcopal or, or yeah, bishop so um, towns which were uh, having uh, um, a bishop as some kind of major power, so not a public entity. We had um, princely towns, uh, so um, a lord, earl, duke, uh, all these aristocratic um, power structures were at the head of certain uh, um, urbanizations. And the free town, the commune, the civic town, was uh, in the late Middle Ages still quite an exception. And uh, self-organization or something like a yeah, self-organized body is then to be read in relation to these other um, medieval feudal powers. Um, in Northern Italy, access to such resources as the land um, and cultivating it was even the basis for the development of forms of local self-government, which refers to the commune. Um, in this plan of the 17th century, a rather late um, cartography of a, a common land, we see the organizational and, and spatial difference between the common land on the left-hand side and the various uh, parcels of the different peasants uh, on which they produce not only for themselves but also for um, uh, their landlord. And um, this harsh uh, concurrence for the resources ended of course or was cross transgressed as you know by many uh, wars and riots of peasants which um, yeah, we're trying to um, yeah fight for their uh, uh, accessibility to the struggles and to the uh, to to um, the resources, and we see it in the further on development of the map of of Europe uh, to what kind of uh, very um, peculiar spatial situation this led in the in the center of the continent. The enclosure of the commons um, are the markation of the end of the Middle Ages. And um, with this image, uh, I, I wanted to understand how the idea of commons actually was inserted into the um, map of London in a quite, um, yeah, um, um, remarkable way because the idea of a surrounded, enclosed, protected space as a commons turns into a type of space which becomes extremely exclusive and depending on um, yeah, whether you could allow yourself to be uh, located around this space. Um, another very different example how the organization of wide open universal resources re-enters the city but here laid out on a baroque kind of pattern is um, yeah the step in Paris where uh, the yeah the plan of Versailles is kind of in parts being re-implemented into the city and opens up this large square next to the Tuileries which was then also becoming yeah, also due to its sheer size and openness and accessibility, the 
place of one of the major places for um, the French Revolution uh, and the counter revolution and the following up of many, many um, barricade uh, constructed fights happening in the streets of Paris and which then um, just between uh, February Revolution and the Paris Commune um, gave rise to the idea by Napoleon III to establish this um, quite crucial and radical and violent plan of Haussmann to completely transform the city. And um, this color code, maybe to come once back again on that, uh, helps us, I think, to read these uh, spatial productions of um, erasing uh, parts of the Paris city, which were in big part self-organized life happening on the streets. Um, being very inclusive and accessible for many people and uh, turning it in a, to a completely different spatial system, also producing spaces like that, which might be called self-organized common lands as well, at the borders of the city and creating spaces uh, like this one, very controlled, very public, um, very uh, state um, adapted and very bourgeois. And I will jump over the philanthropic utopias to make uh, um, yeah, the move towards uh, Berlin where a very different plan to the one of Hausmann was established by Hoprecht, where an extension of the city avoided to actually um, interfere with the existing structure, but established a very economic plan uh, of built areas which were given over to investors uh, and marked, oops, wrong direction, and marked a perimeter of uh, city extension, which was due to the um, big housing crisis in Berlin at that time and the yeah, crazy rents um, opening up um, a space like the free state of Barakia in front of uh, those uh, extension or actually in the middle of those ex extension areas and a self-organized settlement which lasted for a couple of years and was then um, cleared um, which yeah could be, maybe be another link or step or trace of the traditional common land giving us an idea what the urban commons uh, is also and has always been and how the ongoing commoning in the urban fabric um, finds different ways of spatial expression, but it's always based on the idea of um, appropriation, self-organization and creating inclusive spaces. A very quick jump towards the Vienna settlement, which can be read in that way of self-claiming cities self-built uh, structures, self-organization, and uh, trying to um, yeah, cope on an independent way um, beyond the state or city uh, controlled planning, which doesn't sufficiently provide housing. But here we have another move. The um, Vienna city government actually kind of adopted or took over or or institutionalized this self-built settlements and integrated it into their mode of urban planning, which is still the basis for the large amount of housing in Vienna uh, being city owned, I think 60%, and which is working very differently than the many, many um, modern settlements uh, all over, um, in that case, Germany of only, yeah, some of them, having a large uh, percentage of commoning and being self-organized, but it's rather uh, a communal, uh, political, public project, or in the case of Frankfurt, also a very much investor-driven project by then already. And then, of course, the counter project in the Soviet Union with the Narkomfin is um, yeah, completely beyond any kind of market economy established. Uh, space production. With this we enter um, yeah by again the insufficient <laughs> uh, um, integration of 
of maps into a post-war era where the idea of the commons in the 60s without necessarily naming them became again extremely dominant in um, mainly theoretical but also uh, practical um, understandings of, of architecture and urban space production to name only two of them uh, in Graz, um, a collective housing project uh, based on uh, collective but still private ownership and then the much more self-organized and inclusive and crazy uh, structure of Lucien Kroll for the students of, um, of KU Leuven. The situation in Berlin uh, after the war was an extremely complex one. You see here the land use plan of Berlin and with this I already open up for uh, the mapping example which I brought to you. There was a highway plant uh, in Berlin um, thinking that uh, it could be useful in the 1960s to have a high degree of infrastructure and next to this highway um, this building uh, would have been or was planned and executed and still stands there on that site and was meant as a life uh, as a a noise barrier towards the highway. The highway was never built since uh, the protest was so big with the squatter scene in Berlin and out of the squatters scene, um, a large solidarization with people living in that area. The highway was not built, but that one large building was built and several more as noise protection was. And out of this squatters movement, which you again could interpret as a genuine uh, commoning uh, process, the gentle urban renewal, renewal as a as a Berlin Senate based public planning program was established, and in the west of West Berlin, you had the notion of critical reconstruction in the 80s in the International Building Exhibition, and in the east of West Berlin, there was a, a focus on existing uh, refurbishment, re renewal, uh, and even a gentle urban renewal with lots of participation processes, many uh, cooperatives, but other institutions as well um, based themselves <clears throat> on principles of self-governance. And we're able to um, establish housing concepts uh, with a high ecological, social, and um, economic resourcefulness way of uh, renewing the structures. That's why we have today still um, this cooperative, for example, with more than um, 20 houses around this square, which enables still today, also for the ground floor, uses a very different economy. But we also have also these kind of uh, renewal architectures, which uh, had for a long time um, a very steady uh, tenants uh, ship, but then got sold by the Berlin Senate. And it's now exactly those participatory developed architectures, which are owned by Deutsche Wohnen, AK um, Bonovia, and which turned into a club good. So uh, the self-determined uh, renewal project together with the public uh, planning authorities uh, was given over to the market and therefore became a club good. Two mappings I would like to quickly, although I'm out of time, but I will run through it uh, fast if that's still okay. No, I maybe I mean five five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, You're already out of, out of time, but we want to see the mapping. So five. Voila. So the one of the um, um, the mappings we did with students is exactly this kind of uh, the Hobrecht extension plan. So an idea of investor-driven uh, uh, production of, of the Meats Kaserne in the end, uh, which was part of this um, IBA in 87, which um, yeah, made it possible to renew a lot of uh, the existing building structure with participatory programs. And what is um, exciting is that you can still see the results or the, the yields of this uh, process today. So in one week, uh, we were there to um, not only uh, map the spatial resources as such, but we focused on the question of how the neighborhood as a commons could be read through the appropriation of spaces. And what came out in the mapping is that um, 
yeah, the Nolly plan kind of logic we installed was actually not sufficient to uh, to cope with the day per day production of that neighborhood. So what you can see is some kind of gray zone between the private inner of the building and the public wide street space and many actions which are um, yeah, negotiating between those two and therefore creating uh, possibilities of, of appropriation and opening up spaces. At certain moments, we also uh, yeah, uh, observe the opposite. Uh, space being taken over by the economy of certain uh, ground floor activities and closing it up. But what was important for us is to open up a different reading of this neighborhood by changing the perimeter between inside and outside into something which indicates where uh, commoning is opening up spaces and where this commoning or clubbing maybe is closing off spaces. And I think in this black and white, uh, yeah, diagrammatic, this can be read very well. This we took uh, with us into another mapping project where we did not rely anymore with students on the, um, yeah, on the observations and interviews, but um, in the frame of uh, any NGBK and Art Association, uh, we work with uh, five more colleagues on a map where we integrated the knowledge, but not only the knowledge of the local uh, neighborhood um, civilians, but also the question uh, what the map should be allowed to show. So we collected all kind of data, which you can see in this endless tabella, but together with uh, the people running shops here or living here, we decided how much of this collected knowledge should actually enter this map, which was published in a newspaper. This is um, public property in 1993. That was where the highway should have built, by the way. And the black um, property is the club property being sold out by the Senate to large uh, real estate companies. So a big loss of um, space. And what we argued is that this invisible um, ownership structures, they influence uh, daily life. And these daily life situations, you can see in the hand drawn level where we indicate all kinds of things going on and happening and especially highlighting uh, situations where there is a collectivized property, for example, Mitzvah Syndicat, Tenants uh, Syndicate, or the cooperative I was talking about before, Luisenstadt EG. So the little niches within this um, mainly private and club ownership and the public street. And so the few niches we find of collectivized ownership and how, yeah, endless in endless processes of rereading this daily uh, narratives, how this interferes daily life. So there is a clear relation between the invisible ownership um, structures and how it affects our reception on a, on a daily percept, uh, on a daily base. Um, we made an update of this map and this is the building which worked as a sound barrier. This is the plan of the highway through uh, Kreuzberg. And this building um, got uh, bought by the commune and is re uh, yeah not re actually it's got yeah publicized i don't know how you would say this in the correct way in english uh, one of the few uh, truly uh, public owned resources in that area and um yeah with with this kind of uh, yeah trial to integrate the um yeah, super dense uh, historic um, yeah layers behind the evolution of of that street and it's it's being yeah constituted in such a way like it is today, with all its uh, processes of gentrification and displacement going on. Uh, I think I will end and maybe we can um, talk later on about um, yeah the relations between the different uh, thoughts. Thank you very much.